Hey everybody, welcome back. Uh, here we are. The sermon title today is Eager. I'm uh, going to be preaching out of Psalms chapter 1, 22, verses 1 through 8. Uh, this was a piece of the scripture that we actually used at the Advent reading as we are kicking off Christmas. Here we are four weeks away from celebrating the birth of our uh, Savior Jesus Christ. And time is flying by. Christmas trees are going up. Uh, Christmas carols have been sung for a while. You know, the radio is going. Um, and before we know it, we'll be at Christmas. But this is the beginning of it. This is the hopeful, the exciting time. And as we lit the Advent candle today in church, this was the candle of hope. Okay, hope for what is to come. Now, I asked this question about, you know, being, being busy and how many of you guys are busy? You know, and of course, uh, a lot of the younger people, a lot of kids were like, oh yeah, of course. And then I said, what would it be like if you could get just a couple more hours of sleep every night? And their eyes got big, you know, that was eager and excitement. And, and then I said, but, but what about like Sunday morning? They really follow me. I'm like, well, here you are, you know, over at Mount Hope, we start at nine o'clock in the morning. You know, we're up, we're at church, and it'd be really nice to stay in bed and to sleep for a couple more hours. Then I went on, I said, were you excited to get up this morning? Did you like hop out of bed and say, yeah, it's church time. I got to go. I got to go. I can't wait. Can't wait to be there. There was actually, I have some pretty bubbly people in a couple of my congregations. There was a couple of them that were smiling like, yeah, I really was. And I believed them. But for the most part, myself included, even when I got up this morning uh, to do this sermon, uh, to write this sermon before uh, church and, and even today to record it, I was extremely tired. I had a late night the night before. So knowing that I was preaching about excitement and being eager to come to church, I was just dogging. I was dragging. I even said to my wife on the way to church, I'm like, I've been on a kick where I'm not drinking any pop. And I'm like, I really need a Mountain Dew or something to get me up and going. But I don't know how all of us are. Are we up and going with eager and excitement? Well, I want to tell you how my kids woke up uh, the day that I gave this sermon in church. Now, I don't know if you've heard of Elf on the Shelf. Uh, maybe if you have kids, you've done this. But it's, you know, you, you get an elf from the North Pole and uh, you move him around every night. And uh, he goes back and tells Santa if the kids were good during the day. Well, it's something we've done in our household for a few years. And our elf's name is Freckles, okay? I don't know how he got named that. Job named him that years ago. Now, Freckles usually comes back after Thanksgiving, 1st December, somewhere in there. Well, Freckles, when he comes back, likes to leave notes on the table. So Sunday morning before church, uh, Freckles had made his debut, and all the kids were asleep. And in my house, if you saw my older sermons, you kind of see I got my uh, fireplace there. I kind of stood by the fireplace, and you look up, there's two rooms to the side and two up here, just four big rooms, open area. And I hollered up, and I said, hey, guys, uh, I go, there's a note on the table. That's all I said. My kids came flying downstairs. Nellie and her cousin was having a sleepover. Rachel came running down the stairs. Uh, Travis came just flying down the stairs as fast as they could. They couldn't wait to see Freckles. They were excited. Normally Sunday mornings, I got to roll Travis out of bed. I got to holler up like five times. Like, come on, guys, time to get ready. But they were eager. They were excited. They were excited to see freckles because that's the start of the Christmas season of what is to come, of the joy of Christmas morning. Now, think about how you got ready for church. Did you, did you get ready for like that? Probably not, if you're being honest. Um, you probably didn't have that eagerness and excitement and that bounce that flew down the steps. Now, I want to take us into our scripture today so we can hear exactly how we should uh, prepare and be excited for worship. And this is the word of the Lord coming out of Psalms uh, 122, verse 1 through 8. It says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And now here we are standing inside your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is a well-built city. Its seamless walls cannot be breached. All the tribes of Israel, the Lord's people, make their pilgrimage here. They come to give thanks to the name of the Lord as the law requires of Israel. Here stands the throne where judgment is given, the thrones of the dynasty of David. Pray for peace in Jerusalem. May all who love this city prosper. O Jerusalem, may there be peace within your walls and prosperity 
in your palaces. For the sake of my family and friends, I will say, may you have peace. The Lord had a blessing reading of his word. I'm going to break this scripture down a little bit with a few bit of questions. Uh, the first one says, uh, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Are you excited? Are you eager on Sunday morning to get to church? Are you glad? I mean, the psalmist right here is like, we're going over to the church. Let's go. He was excited to go. Or do you feel like maybe you're forced to drag your butt out of bed, stumble through some coffee, and get yourself to church, and then just sit through it? Well, this scripture tells us I was glad we should be excited, yet here we are now. Verse 2 says, and now here we are, standing inside your gates, O Jerusalem. You're inside the church. Uh, if, if you're going to church, uh, maybe you're just watching this uh, because you missed church this Sunday or whatever. But when you go to church, you sit around, you see the four walls. You're listening to the preacher talk. Are you excited then? Do you think, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a week off. I'm going to have a great vacation. And I'm so excited. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to church seven days in a row. I'm going to go and sit down. Scripture says, I was glad. And here we are, inside your gates of Jerusalem. Now, this is talking about the city, but we're using the city of Jerusalem as, as kind of like the big C church and a bit of a metaphor here as uh, we understand that the new Jerusalem will be built. So that's where I'm going with this. It says, Jerusalem is a well-built city. Its seamless walls cannot be breached. Uh, I asked this question to my congregations. I'm like, is this building a fortress? Both churches answered exactly how I wanted them. They said, no, it's not a fortress, it's a church. And I said, you're wrong. I said, a fortress is a place where you come to defend yourself. It's your stronghold where if somebody attacks you, you want to be here. You want to be protected. I said, this church is a fortress. You come here every Sunday to build up your defenses against Satan and against the world. I had them look around at the walls. I said, how thick are these walls? He said, do you think it'd stop many attacks if, you know, say a tank or something would drive right through our walls? Do you think these walls would hold anything up? They said, no, of course not. I'm like, well, let's think about this church and our church body as a body of believers. In our walls is kind of our faith that protects us. So I said that, I, I made him ponder that thought and didn't go into any more detail. Then I went on to the next verse. I said, all the tribes of Israel, the Lord's people make the pilgrimage here. I think it's really exciting when you come to church on Sunday morning to know that all across the world, all across the U.S., there are people worshiping. And you know what? It looks a lot different in your church than it does in Africa, than it does maybe across town. You know, I had somebody came here, and they're like, oh, you know, it's kind of neat, a little eclectic church, a little different, different from what I'm used to. But we're told all people of all tongues, tribes, and nations will pilgrim here. Tribes of people eager to make a pilgrimage to this place. You know, I was at uh, Zion National Park, did a sermon a little bit about it, had some background pictures, stuff we took. And as I read through this, that's what I think about of this pilgrimage of people from all over the world just flocking in. When we were walking on the trails in Zion, it was different language and different nationality, one after another. And when you think about church being that place where God has called us all doesn't matter the race, doesn't matter your nationality. He has called us all to come into his kingdom. It's an amazing thought. All tongues, all tribes, and all nations are welcome. It says they come to give thanks to the name of the Lord, as the law requires of Israel. Now give thanks to the name of the Lord. I just preached on this uh, my previous sermon as we went through Thanksgiving about why do we give thanks. You know, it's not always that we're excited or Things are going good. There's terrible moments in our life that rip our heart out. You know, we're called to give thanks. Well, we give thanks because of we have an unshakable kingdom that Christ has given for us. So here we are to come to church. No matter what we're going through, good, bad, or the ugly, we come and we give thanks. Here in verse 5, it says, Here stand the thrones where judgment is given, the thrones of the dynasty of David. The judgment thrones. How do we go from giving thanks and being eager and excited to go to church to now we stand before the judgment thrones? I'd ask you a question. You ever been to court? If you've ever been to court, 
uh, you're usually not very excited to go, especially if you're sitting in the defendant chair. If you're the one that's being prosecuted, being accused, you're not excited to go there. You're not eager. You know, we say here stand the thrones where judgment is given. We stand in the place of judgment. We should be excited to go here and listen why, as crazy as this may seem. Because we stand before the throne of judgment someday. We understand that the judge is a perfect judge. He can see everything about our life. He looks into us. He sees our good. He sees our bad. He sees that we are unrighteous. And he looks upon us with mercy. Meanwhile, the prosecutor, Satan, I mean, that, that is his job, right? If, if you don't know that about Scripture, Satan's job is, is to seek, to destroy, and, and to call out what you've done, all the bad things. And we have the prosecutor that's just screaming out all the terrible things that you've done, and you're standing there before the throne of judgment, and Satan is just ripping you down. And God's looking, and he knows your heart, and he knows that everything that Satan is saying is true. Yet in God's mercy, he looks over to your defense attorney, and that's Jesus Christ, who stands in front of you, sticks his hand out, and you can see the Father through the hole in his hand. And Jesus says, yeah, yeah, I know Lance did that. Satan, you're right. But I paid his punishment. I spilt my blood, Satan. I've paid you for Lance. And the merciful Father looks at the prosecutor, Satan, he looks at the defense attorney, his son, Jesus Christ. And then he looks at you. And instead of casting judgment, cast mercy. So we eagerly come to worship a God who looked at us on the throne of judgment and gave us mercy. It says, pray for peace in Jerusalem. May all who love this city prosper. This church, whatever church you're part of, the city of Jerusalem, sounds like a great place. But churches aren't always full of peace because, well, we tend to fight. So we are called to pray for peace, to work at it, to heal the hurting, to forgive those who have wronged us and to love our enemies. Verse 7 says, O Jerusalem, may there be peace within your walls and prosperity within your palace. Peace within your walls. You know, I, I brought this up earlier and said I'd get back to it. What I told them about the church being a fortress as a place of defense where, where you can go away from Satan attacking you. I said, look around at these walls. And then I brought up the story of Nehemiah. If you don't know the story of Nehemiah, crack open your Bible, read it, or just do a Google search if you want to get the cheat bulletproof of it. Nehemiah's job, he was exiled and he wanted to go back to Jerusalem because that was his homeland. And when he got back to Jerusalem, he saw that his walls were crumbled down and falling. So he took it upon himself. He felt that he was called from God to rebuild the city walls, to make this a great city, to rebuild the walls. So he asked the king for funds, and the king decided to fund it. And he came back, and how was he going to get the workforce? Jerusalem is a huge city. How would they build all these walls? So he got all the people together. He said, hey, here's what we're going to do. Each family is going to build the wall directly outside of their house. Think about how genius that was. If you're building a fortress, a defensive spot, and the enemy is going to come and attack, the enemy is going to pick the weakest point to come through and destroy. If you were the head of your household or you had children and you needed to build a wall to protect your family, don't you think you would build the strongest wall possible? And as you built your wall, your neighbor right next to you, as his section wall is being built, say you built this giant stone wall and he decides to put up a picket fence. Are you going to be okay with what your neighbor's doing? No, because the enemy will come through there, they'll take him out, and they'll take you out. So here in the church, we build this fortress and we hold each other accountable. First, it's our faith in Jesus Christ. It's our relationship with Jesus Christ. We build our own wall. We strengthen our lives with prayer, with the reading of his word, our relationship with Jesus Christ. And then as our wall is being built, we look to the sides, to our believers around us, to our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we see areas they're struggling where their wall is weak, and we say, hey, let me help you with that. Let me build your wall. 
And when you get a whole body of believers that is looking out for each other's wall and in trying to build up each other's faith, we build a church that is impenetrable from attacks from Satan. That is why we're called to pray for peace as we get into verse 8. It says, for the sake of my family and friends, I will say, may you have peace. Come to a church that has a fortress of walls built around you where it's a peaceful place because the faith and the actions of the people are so strong that they are, their sole purpose is not to tear anyone down. It's not to make their wall be stronger than anyone else's. It's for everyone's wall to be strong, for everyone's faith to be grown. So why should we do this? So why do we have peace? We listen to the scripture about the city of Jerusalem. That's the big C church, the fellowship of believers. It's a perfect place. It's a place that we should all long to be at. You know, like this morning when I started off and I was telling you, did you get up for church this morning and were excited like my kids did? When I said, hey, there's a note on the table and they came flying down the steps. Guys, if you were being attacked, think to uh, if you watched the Lord of the Rings movies where they say, we'll go to Helm's Gate or Helm's Deep or whatever it is. When all the people pack up, do they just casually walk to their fortress? No, nah, they run. They take as little as they can and with eager. They take off to get to their fortress. Guys, I'm gonna challenge you today. Get your butt to church. Get in a building with a fellowship of believers. Build your wall. And when your wall has fallen down, look for someone who says, hey, let me help you. And maybe you're in a place spiritually where your faith is rock solid so you can be there to help someone else. I challenge you, put a little pep in your step, a little excitement to go to church. Come to church, build your wall, and protect your neighbors and everyone else around you. So every week, this is your fortress so we can withstand the fiery darts that Satan throws in our life. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I uh, thank you for your scripture, for how you tell us right away. I was glad to go to the house of the Lord. Lord, if the people are watching this uh, right now and maybe they haven't been to church and they're thinking, man, this guy's talking to me. I am. I say, oh, I just need a sign from God. Well, you know what? <laughs> Here's your sign from God. Get your butt in church. Lord, I pray for whoever it is that they will find a church that, that follows your word, that preaches the authority of scripture and biblical truths. And Lord, they will go and their wall will get built and they will help build others' walls. Lord, let them eagerly go to church with excitement so that they can withstand whatever it is that Satan wants to throw at them. All this in your son, Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys. Uh, don't forget, give a little grace. See ya. Hey, guys, thanks for watching our videos. Once again, we really appreciate it. Uh, if you enjoy it, you know the whole drill. Click, like, subscribe, whatever you got to do, uh, so that as soon as our videos are out, you can see what we have. We really appreciate it. Thanks. Have a great day.